I didn't get good talking on TV just like that, you know? It's just experience building, so that's the first thing. Now, the, the best advice I can give is try to find ways to make it engaging and just easy to understand. For me, it's the biggest barrier I see with researchers is they're, they're used to present in scientific meetings and uh, that kind of stuff. And you need to completely have another way of communicating. Explain things like you would try to explain it to a bunch of kids at a pool party. Welcome to this new episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. Today, I'm over the moon happy to have with me Olivier Bernard. Olivier is a pharmacist and fellow of the Ordre des Pharmaciens du Québec and has a master's degree in molecular genetics. You may know him as Le Pharmacien, the name of his TV series, book series and website. Olivier worked for a few years in the pharmaceutical industry, but his fascination and exasperation with scientific and medical myths led him to become a popularizer whose number one enemy is pseudoscience. Since 2012, he has been creating cartoons, writing books, producing and hosting the TV series Les Aventures du Pharmacien, and more recently, the podcast Derive, where he tries to understand how beliefs lead people to tragic fates in their quest for spirituality, health, or personal growth. So where does pseudoscience come from? Why does it have such appeal? How do we dismantle it? These are some of the subjects we're going to be talking about today with Olivier. Olivier, welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. Super happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Olivier, uh, for people who just heard your bio, can you talk about how you came to you know, start a career as a pharmacist and then uh, go into a master's in, uh, in molecular genetics, but all throughout, throughout this, uh, this professional journey, including communication and, and, and popularization and, and debunking pseudoscience. How, how did that happen? Yeah, so I always, I, I always kind of knew that I would go in uh, the scientific field, probably healthcare. I, I, I kind of liked chemistry and also biology and human health, uh, but, you know, how the human body works. So I knew I would do something regarding these kind of topics. Uh, so I went in f into pharmacy, like just I like this. I didn't know w what I wanted to do. Uh, I just put pharmacy on my application form for college. Uh, I liked it, but at the end of my uh, at the end of my bachelor's degree, uh, I knew I didn't want to be only a pharmacist. So when I graduated in two thousand four, I wanted to try different things. So I did a couple of years in a research lab. Then I went to work in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. So I tried different things. And then at the end of the day, I, I felt like I had this need or this uh, urge to try to reach more people, to try to communicate some things regarding scientific myths or uh, uh, you know, preconceptions or beliefs. And uh, I tried to just build a website and social medias, which were pretty new at the time. And uh, from 2012, it just started from there. Mm -hmm. And a question that I that I have even from our conversation before is: there, I'm thinking of the the origin story, you know, of of, of all that you did. Did pseudoscience, did false beliefs have somehow an impact on you or on someone around you while growing up? Why, why this passion for this particular subject? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I don't remember, like, you know, some, I, I meet science communicators who also are very interested and involved in pseudoscience, uh, you know, debunking worldwide and Pretty often they have a personal story, like e either they were themselves, like I I've met like people who were uh, naturopaths in a, another career or people who've had someone close to them that had cancer and didn't want to get treatment or I didn't have any of that, to be honest. But I think I was al always fascinated by weird things. And, uh, you know, I was I was the kid who uh, I, I read magazines about UFOs and uh you know, the, the pyramids were built by aliens. And uh, I think I liked 
I liked that kind of stuff myself when I was young, but I was asking a lot of questions and maybe not getting the answers. So I think I was always fascinated by that. And when I entered the medical field and I realized, well, you know what? Some people believe stuff that is not true. Like we know for a fact it's not accurate and it causes them harm. It kind of clicked at that point. Like as a pharmacist, when I, I saw people who were like they, they had actual measurable arm f- from their beliefs. Um, that's when it started becoming more uh, a concern and a, a passion. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, me. this kind of fast forwards uh, our conversation to uh, th- what you did uh, on Derive, which is the series about uh, people, you know, looking for things like ayahuasca to, uh, a- and then having some of them dying eventually. And this is kind of the extreme of what you just said. Uh, although it's not medical, it's, it's, it's something different, but still these people are looking for something that is going to bring him to another, I don't know, spiritual uh, level or to maybe heal something they have inside emotionally. And they end up fall- falling into this culture uh, where there's you know it's kind of you were talking about ufos it's it's all kind of paranormal to a certain uh, to a certain uh, there's a gray area between spirituality and the and and what what you described in the show but um i think that's exactly the extreme uh, of what you just said it's not not taking a treatment for cancer it's actually taking something that en- ends up leading to your death because you believe somehow you you started believing in a myth or in in a rhetoric about i don't know a treatment a practice uh and and uh, that's where i think it it gets difficult so in your in your um experience you know all this is reading these things about ufo's py- pyramids etc um exploring and doing this investigative uh, uh you know reporting and 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 creating this this podcast uh around this specific theme you had to travel you had to go talk to people do you have any uh, personal uh, kind of conclusion? Not conclusion is not the right term, but you know, personal idea that's forming in your head of what a belief is and and how why do people hang on to them? Because uh, they hang on to them really hard. We 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 can talk about later about how to let make people depart from false beliefs, but it's really difficult, right? Yes. Uh, you know, it's it's something I I'm thinking about myself all the time. Uh, and you know, in 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 my uh, investigative series, uh, Derive, uh, you know, the, the first season was about a woman who went into a sweat lodge, uh, and she she died because it was an, an extreme sw- uh, sweating uh, session, and she she died after many hours being in an extreme sweat experiment. The second season is about a young man who was. Uh, taking more and more, uh, you know, uh, hallucin- hallucinogens and psychedelics and ended up uh, maybe or not, maybe harming himself because of that. And uh, and now I'm, I'm working on a new season now, which is also about someone who went, you know, like at first into this kind of tendency or this kind of trend and it ended up killing him. And the more I do these kind of stories and the more I realize they're all, they have a lot in common. Um, all of these people, they start by just, they, they, they want to change something about their life. They kind of want something better. They want to improve their well-being. They want to improve just feeling good. You know, it just starts with that. Uh, it also sometimes it's it can be um, uh, it's some people want to kind of build a new life for 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 themselves. Like the woman who was in the sweat lodge, she wanted to be also she wanted to do that kind of stuff herself, like being a mentor or being uh, organizing these events. The young man who took a ayahuasca, it's the same thing. He wanted to do kind of a, a facilitator. So I think that these people, what they want is what we all want. Basically, you just we want to have good lives, uh, fulfilling lives, and it's it's a legitimate need, uh, of course. Now, 
there are some things in life that can, if you go, if you go into the extremes of it, it can be harmful, it can be dangerous to yourself. Um, now, it's true for many things. Like I had one specialist give me the example of, uh, you know, mountaineers. They climb Everest and they lose fingers and they're like, I don't care. Like for me, climbing these mountains is more important than my fingers. It's hard to, it's hard to understand, but now I, I, I guess it's okay. I mean, if they're okay with that. But a lot of people go into these things, like especially healthcare related things or spiritual things that kind of, you know, you, you said it, like sometimes spirituality blends with science-like statements, like uh, you're going to purify yourself, both your mind and your body and all that. Sometimes they just don't know it's going to be harmful for them. And that I think that's the main that was the common theme among all of these. It's, you know, just people doing something that they think is only good and they just disregard all the potential risks. And this is often inside a culture where the risks are very much like you're not, you're not encouraged to look at the risk, but only what's good about that. And that, I, I think that's one of the things that's the most dangerous uh, when it's always it's all good and it's never harmful, you, it should be a red flag for sure. So it feels to me like, um, well, from what you're saying, people have uh, this idea of the ideal world or just an idea of how the world works that they feel comfortable with, and sometimes they can be in a situation where they feel uncomfortable. Something is not working. They don't feel fulfilled, and so they they hang on to these beliefs and and in in the idea of if i get there everything is going to be fine and we kind of all of do that in a way why why do we work why do we build things why do we have projects because we want to we want to be fulfilled but um in 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 the case of, of especially of these of, of derive this is quite extreme but let's say something maybe something more very much smaller and with lesser effect flat earth flat earthers they hang on to that idea of flat earth very strongly because somehow i guess it may, life makes more sense to, to, to them like that but then if we can move a little bit and and say okay climate change it's even it's now it's different you know there's just people who are on the spectrum of being anxious about uh you know eco anxious and 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 actually stress and actually having mental health issues to do with this with seeing the world change at a, at a rate that they that, that's uncomfortable to them and 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 that we can see day by day but then there's people who are just skeptical about it and uh i guess for them it's the same thing their view of the world and 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 hanging on to that idea makes them more comfortable waking up every day and saying um saying this is how i see the world and and you know don't change my mind so i guess your role as someone who wants to debunk uh pseudoscience and and false beliefs is quite difficult because there's a lot of emotion in all of these things now you mentioned in another conversation before that sometimes humor is a way to diffuse that and to be able to start a conversation is 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 that something i know it's something that you've used in the past but I imagine there's good practices on how and when to use it, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I've I right from the start when I when I started doing cartoons online and videos and in 2012, right from the start there was a lot of humor into it and I think that's actually I I, I kind of, I, what I did was working because of that. It was generating a lot of interest. It's pretty rare to hear like, you know, Prof healthcare professionals making jokes and all that uh maybe a bit more frequent now but at the time it was completely unheard of so i guess it it worked very well now i think humor can be a double edged sword and what i mean by that is that uh when i started i was just you know uh yeah i was i, I was i was like um making jokes about a lot of things not thinking about yeah, but for some people, it's going to be 
like some people are not going to like the fact that I'm maybe laughing a bit about that, like detox, detoxing the beliefs behind that are pretty absurd when you look at it. Like from so, for someone who's in the scientific field, you, you just read about detox. It just makes so much, it's so much nonsense that you can only laugh about it in a way. Now, if you want to just laugh about it, that's fine. You're going to reach quite a few people. But there are, there are some people that uh, you might want to reach that they're not going to respond very well to that because... If you if they watch you just making jokes about that, maybe they'll think you're not credible. Maybe they th- they'll think that you, you you're not taking this seriously. That you haven't really thought about that. And those who actually promote pseudoscience uh, in in general, they're usually well. Usually, it's hard to say, but a lot of people who are big promoters of pseudoscience, I think they're genuine. I think they're uh, they're people who really genuinely believe that what they say is true. And they're being very serious. So if you're, I, I think humor is a very good vehicle to explain things, to make it, you know, more digestible. So it's funnier. You learn better when it's fun, when it's, uh, you know. But again, for me, it was I over the ten years or so I've been doing this, I've toned down the humor, and now I use it in very specific moments, and not all the time, because again. My goal is not to talk to a bunch of people who are already convinced of what I have to say. If if I was doing that, that would have no purpose. What I want is to reach people who, who need to hear this stuff. And then sometimes for these people to listen to you, humor is not the is not the good vehicle. So I think you need to stay flexible with that. And in my podcast, Derive, there's no, no humor. Not at all. It's very serious. Because I thought that was in that case that was the it was not the way to go. It's funny. Uh, I just had a conversation a few uh, a few episodes ago with Vicky Pedno or Biolovic, and she talked about the the concept of punching down. You never want to punch down, and it feels like if you're a scientific and making fun of someone who believes something, you're punching down, and so this person will feel insulted by you and will never engage with you in conversation. So it makes total sense what you're saying. Um, so this this makes me feel that so hum, humor can be a, a, a conversation starter, uh, never punching down, always to just diffuse attention in the air. But then you need to you need to have empathy for the people and some seriousness in your discourse. That's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, even me, like right from the start, I had this kind of mantra that I was telling myself pretty often: is you can laugh about ideas but never about people. And I still believe in that. I I still think it's true. Like there are some ideas and concepts, like you mentioned flat earth before. I mean, we can laugh about flat earth. Uh, Now laughing about flat earthers or people who believe in that, that might not be very productive, but finding the idea funny, of course it's funny. Okay. So I I think that you can use, you can like, if, if you go into that, it's, it's fine. But then Sometimes it kind of just, it's hard to say because sometimes I created content where I was convinced that I was really, really not offending anyone, but just only making jokes about ideas. And there are some people that would still find it offensive. So at the end of the day, you need to find some kind of balance. You cannot produce content that's going to please everyone. That's for sure. That's impossible. If that's your objective, that you say like 100% will read that and like it, that's not going to happen. Sorry about that. So for me, it's more about, you know, finding balance, uh, thinking about what's the best way to reach the, as many people as I can. And my personal objective in the last few years has been, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reach people who are, I, try, I, I call them on the fence. You know, people who are not sure what they think should think about this or this like like this new vaccine is it okay i'm not sure i'm i'm kind of not against it but i'm not i'm kind of worried or for me that's these people they're the most important of all you know those who are convinced that it's it's what is scientific is good i i i, I, I don't need, need to, to spend to time on those and, no and those who are anti science or they have they want to have nothing to do with this or this i can't do anything for them either 
So people on the fence. And these people, you need to have good balance in how you communicate. Uh, of course. Yeah, of course. Sure. No, this makes total, total sense. And, uh, you know, I've heard, um, I don't remember the name of the podcast now. It might have been This American Life. Someone, th there's a, a guy, a, a, an African-American who's a jazz person. And it's his whole story on how he got people from the KKK to leave the KKK. But not not on not by convincing them, but they liked jazz, so they were there, so they had some kind of admiration for him as a musician, and that it was and then there was a long process of becoming friends and of the person realizing it, it always for the people who are way back in the, the, the skeptical side of things, it needs to be an internal path of they need to decide to jump on the other side of the fence themselves. It's it's too hard of a fight for one person, for you, for me to change someone's opinion, I think. Yeah. And we've all been there. I mean, I don't know about you, but me, when I started doing this, I was really going like, I'm going to change people's minds, mm -hmm. you know? And <laughs> that's cool. I mean, it's it's it's, it's great to have this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it's kind of optimism in a way. But nowadays... I don't think like that. And I, I I relate to what you just said so much. Like now what I want to do is like maybe add some more perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, hey, you 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 believe that that thing. Uh, I get that. I, I get what why you 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 think that's uh uh maybe true, or I, I get why you're upset or worried about that. I get that, and also part of what you're saying is true. Now, I might have some little more information that I would like to share with you if you want. You know, That's really how I approach every topic now. Um, and it works better. Yeah, it, because somehow, I guess the way you're crafting what you do, you get people to, to go towards you. And then that's half, you've, half of the fight is, is won just there. Because if you go into someone's face and say, here, I have something to tell you, and uh, I'm going to change... That then you you lost. But if you're like kind of just enticing and say, "Hey, uh, I'd love to hear your what you have to say." Actually, I may I may bring one or two variables to 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 your idea, and then the people come. That's half the battle won, I think. And I think it's a it's a great work uh, to doing because it's an effort, I'm sure, to to craft things like that. Well. I, I agree so much. And you know what? Like, even as a pharmacist and as healthcare professionals, there's a lot of, we talk a lot about that, like, for many years now, is it, a lot of, a work, of our work is relationship building. Like, if you build a relationship with your patients, with the people who come to see you to have advice, if they see you as someone who's, who's trustworthy, as someone who's, uh, who can listen, uh, who can make an effort to get your point of view, I mean, that's where you can have a real impact. Uh, it's not just saying, like, do this and go home and, like, just obey. That doesn't work. That does, just doesn't work. And we see it. I mean, it, I see it at, at the pharmacy. I see it at the clinic. It's just, if you just tell people, do this, they, they eventually they won't do it. But if you build a relationship and they see that you're someone who they can trust, then at the end of the day, you're going to have maybe an impact or an influence on that person's life. I think science communication is very much mm -hmm. the same thing. No, no, I totally agree. And um, you, you had mentioned, and you didn't use the word this time, uh, but in our, in our conversation in French, and I, I had really found it interesting that pharmacists, uh, especially those who are in contact with the public, of course, are influencers in mm -hmm. a certain way. And, yeah. uh, and I think it makes total sense with, with, what, with what you just said. Now, now, bringing the conversation back to the, the the usual, you know, the audience of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD, I know a lot of these young researchers, be it, uh, you know, in the PhD, recently graduated or early career researchers who want to um, to embark in, in science communication. I see them taking part in events uh, and trying to learn something about science communication. And, and I know that depending on what they work on, they may be afraid of uh putting themselves out there especially social media today there's there's trolling there's so many so many uh so, so much negative that can come that, that can come from these the, the way the platforms are are created but um i really wonder whether you have a word of, of inspiration 
for someone who uh, now has this kind of mission that they want to that they want to uh, to embark on to debunk something or at least to change some minds about something that's very important to them scientifically and the feeling i get is that when you come straight out of academia you are all about data and i feel that data dumping is an error or is you know it's not the right way to go do you have do you have yeah a word of inspiration and of of maybe uh, uh some some advice for for these young communicators on how to to start having productive conversations yeah absolutely and you know what like I, it, it's almost been like 11 years now that i'm doing you know content like either online or doing tv shows and you know podcasts and stuff on the radio and all and i'm constantly looking for young researchers who are just interested and just they just have a passion for what they do and that they could maybe communicate this to an audience and usually younger audiences like i'm i'm really interested in you know people 40 and below and all that and uh you know i i contact constantly like like even this morning before we talked i was writing to researchers for a new project i'm working on and um most of the times they they, they're, they're, what I see usually is sometimes they don't feel like maybe confident enough, like, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. Well, if you if you don't get the experience, you're never going to get good. Like, I didn't get good talking on TV, like, right, just like yeah. that, you know, <laughs> like, it's yeah. just just something. <laughs> yeah, it's just experience building. So that's the first thing. Uh, being afraid of backlash. I think we spend too much time worrying about that. Like, I've I, I can say with uh, with pretty much good confidence that I've been one of the healthcare professionals who had the most hate in the province of Quebec in the last few years I got a lot of it and it's not so bad like to be honest it's not it's it's really we we should not focus about that really it's just most of the time people are so happy they're so glad I see it I see it on just in the comments of podcasts with researchers like people are so happy to like wow it's so nice to hear someone with this kind of expertise talk about what they do now the the best advice i can give is try to find ways to make it like engaging and just easy to understand um that's I, I, for me it's the biggest barrier i see with researchers is they're they're used to present in scientific meetings and uh that kind of stuff and you need to completely have another way of communicating really just talk to you know explain things like you would try to explain it to a bunch of kids at a pool party you know like there's a bunch of kids who ask you like what do you do and you're like well i'm a i'm a researcher in molecular genetics all right now explain it like you would explain to them and sometimes when i say that people are like yeah, but talking like to kids, it's not, I, I don't want to, to be patronizing and all. No, it's not patronizing because like me, when I want to learn new stuff, that's that's how I want it. I want to start the five-year-old explanation. So make it m a lot easier and that, that than you think is necessary. Start from there and then just leave yourself the room to adjust along Simplify. the way. So I guess... Shed a lot of the data and focus on like one or two key points for a couple of key points. What's practical? Like people don't want to know about the theory. So what's practical? What's in it for them? Uh, and also um, just using normal vocabulary, no complicated words and all that. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, start from there. I'm not saying it's all that, but start from there. Now, now, that's a great starting point uh and uh that's i just got a just had this idea come up of something that that is often uh, mentioned by young researchers or, or phd students it, which is that that the question of uh that family dinner where someone uh is i don't know uh doesn't believe in climate change and uh you know having these difficult conversations uh, about vaccines during during covid for us who are who have studied in this domain of the life sciences 
it's super easy to grasp those you know those those data the, those mechanisms those techniques etc those technologies but it's not for other people and uh, and one of the things that you that you mentioned before is you need to accept that it's not easy for other people to understand and to accept to be able to talk with them but going back to this question of which is particular of there's someone in your family with whom there's often this kind of bickering of uh, of the of the skeptic person versus you and or even it's it re it reveals itself in other ways of but what are you doing doing research anyway well, you know get a real job that's another one that's that often <laughs> happens but but if we go back to to uh, pseudoscience with someone that's close do you is, is this something that's happened to you that you've had to tackle uh, is it something that um, you have advice on how to tackle to, for, for young researchers out there? Oh, yeah. I mean, it happens to all of us who are in the medical or scientific field, like you're at this party or this dinner, and someone comes up with this kind of belief or idea regarding that's kind of related to what you do, and you know it's completely inaccurate. And it's a struggle. Like myself, I've struggled a lot with that. Um, even my, my girlfriend was a big help for me because she was telling me how I did in my in interventions. And early on, you know, the, 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 the results were not that good. Like, uh, because it, 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 sometimes you get angry. You know, when someone's like vaccines are poison and you work in immunology, it's kind of tough to hear. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow to hear that. You know, the first thing you want to say is, well, you don't know what you're talking about, okay? And you can do that and never talk to that person again. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's fine. But sometimes, especially in families or in circles of friends, you can't do that. You, there are some people you need to kind of still engage and find some kind of common ground. And that's my personal strategy is what can we agree on or at least how can I show this person that I'm not the antagonist here? And that's really hard. Like even for me, it's really difficult. So the, 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 the strategy more specifically that I use is some things I alluded to earlier. I have this four, I have this approach in four steps. The first step is listening to the person because if you kind of, if you immediately just say no, that's false because of now, that's you're not in a conversation. So someone says something that you know is not really accurate. So first listen and ask a couple of questions. Like, why do you think that? Why do you think that this is the right worldview by a position to what other people say? Where did you read about that? Etc. That's the first step. Second step, give empathy. So basically saying to the person, well, I can see that it kind of worries you or you're kind of concerned about that. And I can, I can totally get that. I mean, you're, I think it's, it, it's a good thing to maybe be a bit cautious regarding these things or so just validate the person in their feelings or whatever. Then find something that you can both maybe agree on. Like, well, you know, regarding vaccines, well, of course, there are some vaccines that have been like not so good in the past. It's true. Or maybe their transparency regarding prices are not very, you know, find something you can agree on. If you do these three things, just these three things, well, at that point, you won't be in a position to one another. Okay. Because the person will have seen, well, this person is is listening to me, is asking me questions to better understand what I think, is giving me some kind of validation. And also he says that what I'm saying is not completely false. So, and now once you've done that, if you if you see an opening, then ask the person, hey, I maybe I have another way of looking at things I would like to propose to you if 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 you're interested. If the per yeah, if the person says no, you're like, okay, no problem, man. Just forget about that. But if the person says, well, yeah, go ahead, uh, well, the person might be much more open at that point to just give it a thought and and just also forget the idea of just convincing the person, like, just, just try to add more perspective, maybe another perspective, uh, and the person will, I mean, you just plant a yeah. seed and maybe it will grow later. That's not up to you. I, I love it, and it, it's a great it's a great way to 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 end our our conversation, uh, because 
now looking back at, at, at this half hour that we spent together, the, the thing, if I try to summarize it in one image, uh, if, if you want to deal with a pseudo, with pseudoscience or with a, a false belief in someone that you feel that uh, based on your knowledge that it's deleterious or potentially deleterious to someone, well, no one likes to be preached at, so don't get on your soapbox and preach. That's the first no-no. Don't do that. And I kind of want to bring this uh, new concept of the empathic influencer. I feel that if you can put yourself in a position to first be empathic, because you, you, really, you really kind of show the stepwise way to go. First, listen, then be empathic, uh, then, then uh, show that, you've, that you were listening by kind of retelling the points that you think makes, make sense. And then if, there's, if there is an opening, so there's a lot of empathy in this process of you're saying and a lot of patience on your side. So you need to kind of inspire by example and never by preaching. And, uh, and I feel this is kind of, in a nutshell, res resumes what, what, I, what I feel your message is and your experience has been, or at least where you're at today uh, in your experience. And the other important thing from what you said, and it's a, it's, um, can be stressful for, for people because of, of feelings of, uh, Im of imposter feelings, is when you're invited to do something, go for it. You don't you don't have the yeah, you don't have the absolutely. credentials, but the person or the organization thought of you. Respect that. Respect that that uh, that this organization, this these people, somehow looked at your profile or or read something you wrote and said, you know what, Olivier, David, whoever uh, should be the one. You know, we will invite them for this experiment, for this event, for this. Uh, uh, content creation uh, uh i don't know uh, platform whatever accept it uh, and and it's 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 um it can be difficult because of imposter feelings of course uh, but from what i get olivier you have accepted things before having credentials or official credentials or experience many times throughout your career and it, it just helped you to grow professionally so i think that's the other key take home for me today I still don't have credentials, so I mean, but it's it's a very it's a very good point. Like, there's a lot of, of perceived hierarchy sometimes in academia, and and I think there's a reason for that. But again, I've met some young researchers that are just they were just amazing to explain things, and of course, they didn't have the whole baggage of experience of their elders and people who have been in the field for 35 years, of course they don't have that. But maybe sometimes you have something else. Maybe you relate or you connect better with younger generations who need to be talked in another way. Or maybe you can bring up uh, examples from things that are more modern from, I don't know, like uh, actual trends uh, on social networks, maybe uh, pop culture references, whatever, you know, like don't don't feel like you you're not good enough start from somewhere inside of your field of expertise of course okay i'm not saying just say yes to everything that would be a mistake but if you feel like yeah it is within my expertise then just go for it and sometimes i i've done bad interviews in the past and you know it happens and it's okay you just That's learn it. from that it's, it's all a learning process and um and yeah if someone is giving you an opportunity to try something uh, to try something new trust that they that there's a reason why they why they invited you and what they thought of you yeah and maybe offer yourself like i i get that sometimes people write to me and they're like if you ever need uh, someone in clinical neuropsychology research then i'm here for you and i have a i have a word document where i keep all the names of those people and i do contact them when i get to their topic so Offer you yourself. Also, actually, this is a great way also to, to really end our conversation. If someone that's listening uh, wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, okay. Uh, to reach out to me, what's the best way? That's a good, that's a good question. I'm, I'm uh, running here, if you see here below, your website, your Twitter. So on Facebook, Le Pharmacien, on Twitter, at Le Pharmacien. So if someone do, does want to, to offer uh, to help you in, in your projects, is there a, is Twitter a good way to reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I I almost never tweet. I tweet like twice a year. So 
that's the best way to reach me. And I'm actually not joking. So if you send me a message on Twitter, a, a DM, for sure, I'm going to get it in my email inbox and I'm going to respond to you. So let's awesome. go for that. Olivier, this was great. Uh, I learned a lot. I think there's a lot of uh, inspiring uh, nuggets of, of, uh, of knowledge in, w in what you shared today. And um, thanks again for, for your time and for accepting to come on Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. That was, uh, that was really cool and, in, and fun and interesting. Thank you for listening to another Beyond the Thesis conversation with me, David Mendez, and my guest, Olivier Bernard. If you found any value in this conversation, please share it with someone like you and help Beyond the Thesis reach as many ears as possible. And if you want to help a little bit more, please go to papaphd.com forward slash audience and fill in the survey that is there for you and leave a comment so I can give you a shout out in a future episode. Thank you for being a fan, happy listening and happy sharing. <laughs> <laughs>